I have met many salesmen in my time. During the past ten years, I have personally trained and directed the efforts of more than 3,000 salespeople, both men and women, and I have observed that, without a single exception, the star producers were all people who understood and made good use of the psychology of clothes. I have seen a few well-dressed people who made no outstanding records as salesmen, but I have yet to see the first poorly-dressed man who became a star producer in the field of selling. I have studied the psychology of clothes for so long, and I have watched its effect on people in so many different walks of life, that I am fully convinced there is a close connection between clothes and success. Personally, I feel no need of thirty-one suits of clothes, but if my personality demanded a wardrobe of this size, I would manage to get it, no matter how much it might cost. To be well-dressed, a man should have at least ten suits of clothes. He should have a different suit for each of the seven days of the week, a full-dress suit and a tuxedo for formal evening occasions, and a cutaway for formal afternoon occasions. For summer wear, he should have an assortment of at least four appropriate light suits, with blue coat and white flannel trousers for informal afternoon and evening occasions. If he plays golf, he should have at least one golf suit. This, of course, is for the man who is a notch or two above the mediocre class. The man who is satisfied with mediocrity needs but few clothes. It may be true, as a well-known poet has said, that clothes do not make the man, but no one can deny the fact that good clothes go a very long way toward giving him a favorable start. A man's bank will generally loan him all the money he wants when he does not need it, when he is prosperous. But never go to your bank for a loan with a shabby-looking suit on your back and a look of poverty in your eyes for if you do, you'll get the gate. Success attracts success. There is no escape from this great universal law. Therefore, if you wish to attract success, make sure that you look the part of success, whether your calling is that of day laborer or merchant prince. For the benefit of the more dignified students of this philosophy who may object to resorting to stunt, stimuli, or trick clothing as a means of achieving success, it may be profitably explained that practically every successful man on earth has discovered some form of stimulus through which he can and does drive himself on to greater effort. It may be shocking to members of the Anti-Saloon League, but it is said to be true nevertheless that James Whitcomb Riley wrote his best poems when he was under the influence of alcohol. His stimulus was liquor. The author wishes it distinctly understood that he does not recommend the use of alcohol or narcotic stimuli, for any purpose whatsoever, as either will eventually destroy both mind and body of all who use them. Under the influence of alcohol, Riley became imaginative, enthusiastic, and an entirely different person, according to close personal friends of his. Edwin Barnes spurred himself into the necessary action to produce outstanding results with the aid of good clothes. Some men rise to great heights of achievement as the result of love for some women. Connect this with the brief suggestion to the subject which was made in the introductory lesson, and you will, if you are a person who knows the ways of men, be able to finish the discussion of this particular phase of enthusiasm stimulus without further comment by the author, which might not be appropriate for the younger minds that will assimilate this philosophy. Underworld characters who are engaged in the dangerous business of highway robbery, burglary, etc., generally dope themselves for the occasion of their operations with cocaine, morphine, and other narcotics. Even in this there is a lesson which shows that practically all men need temporary or artificial stimuli to drive them to greater effort than that normally employed in the ordinary pursuits of life. Successful people have discovered ways and means which they believe best suited to their own needs to produce stimuli which cause them to rise to heights of endeavor above the ordinary. One of the most successful writers in the world employs an orchestra of beautifully dressed young women who play for him while he writes. Seated in a room that has been artistically decorated to suit his own taste, under lights that have been colored, tinted, and softened, these beautiful young ladies, dressed in handsome evening gowns, play his favorite music. To use his own words, I become drunk with enthusiasm under the influence of this environment and rise to heights I never know or feel on other occasions. It is then that I do my work. The thoughts pour in on me as if they were dictated by an unseen and unknown power. 
This author gets much of his inspiration from music and art. Once a week he spends at least an hour in an art museum, looking at the works of the masters. On these occasions, again using his own words, I get enough enthusiasm from one hour's visit in the Museum of Art to carry me for two days. Edgar Allan Poe wrote The Raven when, it is reported, he was more than half intoxicated. Oscar Wilde wrote his poems under the influence of a form of stimulus which cannot be appropriately mentioned in a course of this nature. Henry Ford, so it is believed by this author who admits that this is merely the author's opinion, got his real start as the result of his love for his charming life companion. It was she who inspired him, gave him faith in himself, and kept him keyed up so that he carried on in the face of adversities which would have killed off a dozen ordinary men. These incidents are cited as evidence that men of outstanding achievement have, by accident or design, discovered ways and means of stimulating themselves to a high state of enthusiasm. Associate that which has been here stated with what was said concerning the law of the mastermind in the introductory lesson, and you will have an entirely new conception of the modus operandi through which that law may be applied. You will also have a somewhat different understanding of the real purpose of allied effort in a spirit of perfect harmony, which constitutes the best-known method of bringing into use the law of the mastermind. At this point, it seems appropriate to call your attention to the manner in which the lessons of this course blend. You will observe that each lesson covers the subject intended to be covered, and in addition to this, it overlaps and gives the student a better understanding of some other lesson or lessons of the course. In the light of what has been said in this lesson, for example, the student will better understand the real purpose of the law of the mastermind, that purpose being, in the main, a practical method of stimulating the minds of all who participate in the group constituting the mastermind. Times too numerous to be here described, this author has gone into conference with men whose faces showed the signs of care, who had the appearance of worry written all over them, only to see those same men straighten up their shoulders, tilt their chins at a higher angle, soften their faces with smiles of confidence, and get down to business with that sort of enthusiasm which knows no defeat. The change took place the moment the harmony of purpose was established. If a man goes about the affairs of life in the same day in and day out, prosaic, lackadaisical spirit, devoid of enthusiasm, he is doomed to failure. Nothing can save him until he changes his attitude and learns how to stimulate his mind and body to unusual heights of enthusiasm at will. The author is unwilling to leave this subject without having stated the principle here described in so many different ways that it is bound to be understood and also respected by the students of this course, who, all will remember, are men and women of all sorts of natures, experiences, and degrees of intelligence. For this reason, much repetition is essential, 